You guys look like... What do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. Get those birds! They're coming to get you, Barbara. What are you kidding? We got us a family here. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You are listening to the In the Mouth of Dorkness podcast, the official podcast of the Alamo Draft House Winchester. And welcome to the new episode of the It Modcast podcast. Joining me today on the show is Lisa Gullickson, wife dork. That's just legal hocus pocus. And when he murders again, you will be directly responsible. Also joining me today is Brad Gullickson. There boy. is no. I, I, I spoke right <laughs> over it. I was so excited about my quote. Wait, is I'm this keep your first going. Show? I'm keep going. I'm keep going. I don't care. There is no God. <laughs> that was my quote. He, he's the he's the husband dork. <laughs> <laughs> the husband dork, yes. And I am your host for this week, Brian Young, the turtle dork. Are you an effective team? And welcome to the In My Cash podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I pulled oh, an audible. My heart was was pumping because I had another another quote, and then at the last second, I think maybe I because it was a uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, three quotes last crusade Lisa. last crusade um oh. and i was like uh i think i've done the i'm a scientist quote before you may have i also did an audible because of your audible i went with i was originally going to do a psycho three quote where norman bates talks about uh how conservative clothing never goes out of style and then i decided no let's start with the first line of psycho three there is no god Screaming. <laughs> I went I went with a Psycho 2 quote, technically. Oh, yes, 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 that's yes, the yes. first line of Psycho 3? Psycho 3 is a woman screaming in darkness. It's a total, like, the screen is absolute black, and you hear a woman scream, There is no God! And you feel like some, like, heavy metal shredding should start immediately <laughs> afterwards. Oh, okay. That, and that then, definitely sets the tone. <laughs> And then there is a scene that is very evocative of Vertigo, which yes. uh, we will not be hearing in Brian's Week in Dork. No, we won't. This, no. The Hitchcock streak is over. Is over. It was it's just over. two it's... episodes. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll be it'll be back. Believe me, it, it will be back. It's um, less of a streak and more of a sputter. Yeah. There, there, there you go. There you go. Yeah, but it hasn't come to a complete halt. No, That's no. good. We That's have good. faith. We have faith, Brian, that the Hitchcock box set will be continued to be appreciated in the Turtle Dork household. Absolutely, absolutely. We um, should probably also mention that Brian, or that Darren, is not here yet yes. again. Uh, this time. Uh, we're gonna need some real thoughts and prayers. Yeah, like yeah. not sarcasm, because, like literal. Uh, Darren is not feeling too well. Last we talked to him, Darren may have the COVID. Yeah, he may have it. Um, he did mention it in our group text thread that um, unfortunately he is not privy to being tested because of the lack of tests that is currently available um, and, in the area. Because And you know, also he's not multi-symptomatic. Exactly. Yeah, so, so far, so far he has the body aches and the fever. His descriptor was his body felt like an, a bruise. Like mm. his whole body body felt like a hot bruise. That is so descriptive. Darren is a true poet. Yeah. Oh. And I feel ow. so bad for him. I feel so I, bad for him. I sent him a link to uh, Lord Jones, which is a uh, CBD company. They do have a salt bath, a CBD salt bath to soak okay. that sore bod. And okay. ladies, you can imagine that all you want. <laughs> the disco dork so soaking his sore bod in a CBD salt bath. I know it's somebody's dreams. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. definitely we're, um, yeah, our, our thoughts and prayers, I can do everything that we can give to him at this time. Um, you know, just reaching out, just making sure uh, he's doing good and while he's quarantining. And uh, as he's and back we on still the mend, and we still expect him to edit this podcast. So. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> well, I did reach out. So, you know, I, I know Darren is, he, he could be prideful, especially when it comes to the podcast. You know, this is like his baby. So I definitely want to make sure, you know, we do this right by him. But, you know, I, I could definitely see him being like, no, I got it. I got it. But I'm like, dude, like rest, you know, we, we could take care of it, but we'll, we'll see what he comes up with. Well, if, I can tell we'll... you right now, listener, if you are uh, hearing this podcast on a Monday, that means Darren <laughs> crawled himself out of bed, went through the salt bath CBD <laughs> solution and it, and edited this episode for you. If you're hearing this on like a next Tuesday. Wednesday. <laughs> oh, oh, Okay. <laughs> If you're hearing this and there is no intro yeah. music, yeah, that means that we edited it because he there, has there all of that. Go. That's proprietary disco yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You're right. You're you're right about that, Lisa. So um, so yeah. So definitely uh, send him all the good vibes that that we can, and uh, hope that he gets back on the men uh, pretty soon. And we look forward to having our foursome back in full effect um, yeah. during these during these quarantine times. It so, reminds uh, me of the night. 90s turtle movie he's in yeah. his he's lying sideways in his bath oh. he's Raphael. he's Raphael. does he does he fit in the tub though <laughs> darren does fit in a tub he's petite he's definitely the davy jones of our monkeys okay gotcha. <laughs> and i think brian i think that uh brian is totally mike nesmith i was, about, and, I was just about to say okay <laughs> yeah yeah and then brad is mickey dolan and you're peter Tork. and i'm peter Tork. yeah God, and, okay. But there's a lot more um, kind of uh, sexual tension between Peter, Peter and, and Mickey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, all right. So let me, <laughs> right, let me do this. So Darren would be Leonardo. Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah. Brad is Donatello. Oh, okay. I would say Lisa is Raphael, and Ooh. I would be Mikey. That is completely wrong. <laughs> I know. This is how it actually is. Oh. I'm so sorry. You're Raphael. <laughs> You're moody. Oh, you well, you yeah. have Brian some darkness. Moody? Yes. He's got darkness. Uh, I, if, if anybody's super What's, happy fun times, I'm. That's I'm all, Mikey. Like, all you want is you want to be Mikey. I want to be Mikey. Wants to be Mikey. We can have two Mikey. But see, I, I well, would say no, the only the only reason I would say you were all Raphael because you you got you got I would say Raphael from the '87 cartoon because okay. you're really you're really quippy. You've got the sass, and you you you've got a lot of uh, a lot of one liners. They're really quippy, so and, 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 and okay. really, yeah. So I, I would say the, I would say yeah. Raphael of the cartoon. Series. The important thing is that Brad is Donatello because he's got a really big staff. So, t- <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about my penis. Yeah, I know, I know you are. <laughs> I I know from firsthand experience. Yeah. So wouldn't that make me Donatello? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just the staff. And you're just the staff. Oh, y'all combined just to make one, <laughs> one turtle. Our powers oh, combined. Oh man. Then, okay, then then I'll put then I'll put Billy as Raphael. Does he? Oh my gosh, that she's got some right. darkness That's, going on. That sounds right, actually. <laughs> oh man, so. Uh yeah, good times, good times. This is what you can expect on the It My Cast podcast. <laughs> yeah, and until uh, next time, the episode. That's a, that's I my know, joke right? I made right there. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get into our weeks and dorks. Uh, Lisa, so how was your week? It was wonderful. Uh, this the the unofficial title of my week in dork is a tale of two trilogies because I okay. finished. The Godfather trilogy, finally, I am now, I can now join the bulk of film Twitter as a person who has seen the Godfather trilogy and a little more off the beaten path after our wonderful chat with you last week, Brian, Mm -hmm. and all of the Hitchcock love you were spewing for Psycho, (laughs) we decided to finish the Psycho trilogy. And I had never seen Psycho 2 or Psycho 3. In fact, before last week, I didn't know they existed. And I had to take care of it immediately. So um, let's do the the Godfather part three talk first. Okay. Okay. Um, Now that I have seen the Godfather trilogy, I would say my ranking is two's my fave. Okay. Then comes one and then comes three. Yeah, that makes sense. It does make sense. I have exquisite taste. Um, I mean, I like one the most. I think it goes one, two, three. But I understand why someone, and I understand why you, would like two, one, three. 
Uh, there was a lot more like family drama and two, which I really appreciated. Family drama that did not end well for Anybody. a swath of the family. Same goes with three. A lot of family drama. Not such a great ending for the Corleones. To me, um, Godfather 3 spun out on some of the same themes of two. as Godfather 2. And to me, it didn't, like, it definitely added more information, but I don't think that it added any new ideas for the narrative. Like, if, if, if 2 was the ending, and you imagine what is the future of the Corleone family from the ending of 2, you would come around to something like 3. Yeah. And to me, I found uh, Michael's story of, like, going, like, at the end of 2, he completely leaned into... I am the godfather and I cannot prioritize like and, and my godfatherness cannot be compromised to the point where I'm willing to dispose of what used to matter to me most my family members of my family my love of my father supersedes the love of my wife it supersedes the love of my brother the only people who it may not supersede is the love of his children but at the same time his children are just accessories to his ego yeah. right they're just an extension of his legacy they're not literal people to he him does not recognize at them the end humans. of two yeah so now at this point in his life He's trying to bring it back full circle. He's going, he's seeing kind of the denouement of his career. He is ready to, as soon as he sees like a kind of reliable-ish successor, he starts going, okay, now can I end the career part of my life and restore my family? Can I reach back out to Kay? Can I be a father to my children? He and wants get, to get right with the church. Yeah, let's renew um, my relationship with God. And on all fronts, like, yeah, they so said, much. like, sorry, dude, it's it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, but we knew that. Yeah. We knew that at the end of two. I was trying to think about, like, how I wanted to talk about Godfather 3. And to me, I, like... I didn't, I wasn't very interested in the Vincent storyline. The Andy Garcia character. Uh, yeah, I, I liked him as an actor. I liked him as a character. He's the bastard son of James Caan's character, Santini. Mm -hmm. And and he get, gets in a relationship with his first cousin, Sofia Coppola, who is Mary. Um, Corleone. Mary Corleone. Uh, Michael's daughter. Michael's daughter. I don't know why I can't finish sentences because I have Brad there to do it. Um, uh, and to me, like the the most obvious part of that storyline is like nobody explicitly says like you can't date because it's incest, you guys. Like, mm -hmm. like it keeps going back to like um, that it's a dangerous, dis dangerous yeah. or a disgrace to. Um, to I, because you're, you're trying to think of all the names. Uh, yeah, and I'm so horrible with names. Oh, uh, um, ugh. a disgrace to Michael. Michael's legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. That is a oh, okay. disgrace to Michael's legacy. But like, also, it's gross. Right. Like, yeah. and no one ever says incest in, and, in the course of Godfather Three. Like, hey, that's your first cousin. That's incest. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. <laughs> and and shouldn't be allowed. And even Kay is like, your daughter's in love. You just have to let it happen. And it's just like, I followed you when you were like, your son, he has a love of opera. He wants to be an opera singer. Let him go. And the dad is like, fine, I'll let him go. And then they try to parallel it with Mary, who is kind of his jewel, who he was thinking of once he legitimized his the um, kind of philanthropic arm of his legacy, he was going to give that to her, going like, Mary, 
She's your daughter. She's in love with this boy. You should just let him go. And I'm just like, no, it's gross. She mm. never says, let Mary go. She says, your daughter is in love, and he interrupts her. I don't think Kay would have been okay with her going off with Vincenzo, especially since Vincenzo is basically- He's also a, a, a thug. Yeah, and is a mirror to Michael. Right, like Mary has fallen in love with. But we don't, like, we can only imply Kay's opinion on that relationship right. from how we would feel about it. Right, right, because and Kay never gets to finish it, her, you know, any thoughts. Right, of course. Um, though I do um, like the arc of her character, where in two, she really did accomplish her goal of becoming separate yeah. and creating a separateness between her and Michael that, but maintaining their, the children's love of their father. And mm -hmm. I, and I, that was huge for her. And I do see it like, so in Godfather three, uh, Tony, the son, that's his name, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Tony is premiering in, um, in Sicily. his first opera in Sicily. And so now she is once again on a family trip with Michael and they do have the, have the conversation of like, we will always love each other. Kay is never coming back despite what Michael wants. And something that is true about the Michael character is like, ultimately he never really does get what he wants. No. They, because especially when you go back to his like kind of, independent yeah. roots. Wealth was really never important to him. And the idea of um, make, getting all of this wealth was something that he was gifting to his father's legacy. It was really not something he wanted for himself and really he really enjoyed for himself. Every time we saw him spend money, he spent money on others. We very rarely saw him like explicitly go like, I'm buying this for myself because I've earned this wealth and I want to enjoy it. It was always something that he wanted to give away because it was something that was meaningless to him other than the power that it bestowed on him, which was his gift to his dad. Um, I really like the story arc of Connie, mm. Talia Shire's character, because in Godfather 3, we really do get to see the string puller that she truly is. Where in the first film, she did try to kind of spin off and have her own family life with her husband who turned out to be an abusive piece of trash and didn't ultimately separate her from the family because he was such a layabout and a waste of space that the only way that he could be employed was to be employed by... Um, by the family, by the Corleone family. Then in Godfather 2, her husband is murdered. Murdered. Yeah. So now she is trying to have by Michael. Yeah. Yeah. So now she um sees Michael as okay, I'm part of this family, so I should have an allowance. Yeah. Is yeah, yeah, really yeah. what she saw. Well, she leans in. She leans in. She goes like um, I want the benefits, and the benefits are monetary benefits, um, which Michael didn't relate to at all. Um, either you're in this family or you're out of this family. By the end of that film, we see her transfer the love that she had for Vito, Vito to Michael, and now Michael is in the place of her father, and she's now going to care for Michael the way that she cared for her dad. Including feeding some cannolis. Well, no, that's in three. Oh, so by oh, the yeah. end of two, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, Michael yeah. is now her, now the father, uh -huh. and she is willing to um, move pieces on the board for him so he that so he can um, do his dirty deeds. Yeah, yeah, and in two, she acts as a go between between him and Kay and the mm -hmm. children. In Godfather Three, she has taken on the responsibility of protecting Michael to the point of going like, Michael doesn't want to kill any more people. So, but to keep this machine running, some people gotta die. So um, we see her first calling hits 
Yeah. So, um, with uh, the boyfriend character, Vincenzo. With Vincenzo, she gave, she called the hit of Zaza. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was like her first taste of calling the shots. Because and Michael, Michael was in the hospital. Right. And Michael explicitly, because of Zaza. Yeah. So Michael explicitly said, like, you're not allowed to do that anymore. And I suppose what Connie heard is like, um, I'm not allowed to find out. Like, if you're going to bump somebody off for me, I should not find out. Yeah. Like, just don't tell me. <laughs> and so she takes that very seriously. And she is the one who kind of goes like, I don't mind putting all of our family cards into Vincent's ba basket. Mm -hmm. Like she, I, I really think that she was instrumental in putting him in a position where he is now the right, right because player. He, even though he's a bastard, he is still of the bloodline of Vito. Yes, because he's Sonny's. Yeah, he clearly has. Uh, the chops to take the family on into the next level, or at least that's what she thinks. We really want, in his relationship to Vincent, we really see the complete disintegration of Michael's spine. Because at first, when Vin he invited Vincent to be one of his tough guys because he's Salvatore's son and it's the right thing to do, and Vincent starts inserting himself into meetings, speaking out of turn. And at first, Michael cuts him off at the knees and goes essentially like, don't ever speak if I'm not explicitly asking you to speak. And Michael was like, okay, fine. But then Michael never did shut up. And he was always speaking out in meetings. You mean Vincenzo? Vincenzo. Vincenzo was always speaking out in meetings. And Michael never again like said, stop doing that. And until the point of um, Michael's Michael's voice faded away, and Vincent was the person who um, was directing, kind of directing the action, a until ultimately he became the Don. So, so uh, final thoughts on Godfather, on the Godfather trilogy. Amazing character pieces on all fronts. Everybody gave um, amazing performances. I thought that. The, Everybody, even Sofia Coppola. Oh, I always forget that she's in the movie. I like to me like, bef like the one th like it seems like each um, Godfather movie. There's like one thing I know going in. The one thing I knew going in was Sofia Coppola was supposed to give this horrible performance, and yes, she's not an actress. And there are a lot of scenes, and the scenes where it's most apparent is uh, scenes of voiceover where she had to do voiceover over her own acting, and it's just so shockingly bad. But I didn't find it distracting from the rest of the movie. I didn't, like, it's not like when she was speaking, I wanted to turn the movie off or anything. So I felt like that that was oversold to me. And I still, like, when she was gunned down at the end of the film, which was, like, obviously what was going to happen from the beginning of the film... Um, when she was gunned down at the, I did feel it. I was sad. I yeah. was sad for Michael. I was devastated for Kay. I didn't give a shit about the little opera son, which is surprising. Well, Tony barely has a role in, in the movie. Uh, and, and Pacino, you know, when he witnesses Mary get gunned down, uh, and you know, she says like dad and falls to her, her oblivion. But the way that the film cuts out all sound and we see, the Pacino's devastation, screaming the and devastation, and then the sound cuts in halfway through, or like two thirds of the way through his scream. Very powerful. Yeah, because I do think that that's how. I mean, luckily in my life, I have been a witness to no tragedies. I think zero I murders, zero hits. <laughs> but I do think that, like when, when shocking things are happening, I do think that there is like a kind of a tunnel vision type yeah, of like thing and I felt like the, killer. Yeah. I, I feel like the the cutting out of sound really echoes that kind of very natural thing that happens and so while you did not like three as much as two or one you still like I still I was compelled all the way through I was interested all of the way through it's never going to be my genre would you re-watch it if you were going to re-watch the godfathers one and two yeah 
Yeah, I to me, I'm a completist. I do, I uh, like. I do see it as a trilogy of films, even if I don't feel necessarily that the third film adds anything more than like, oh, so you know this is going to ha- turn out. Let let us help you t- fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the direction is not as strong in the third movie. I think the cinematography is not as strong in the third movie. Uh, I don't think the narrative is nearly as strong, but it's still fun in quotes to be with the Corleone family and to follow them to the end of the line where with Michael, we see him in the final shots of the movie, uh, die as an old man alone in his garden in Sicily with no family, at least he had Vito, little puppy dogs. Yeah. But when Vito died, he had a grandson near him. He had a family in the house next to him. Who's with, uh, Michael in that empty home. Nobody. I do, I, I do love the fact that at, in the second film we really did see how um, the thing that Vito did created community, and then when it was tried to be expanded upon or repeated by Michael, it just ended up alienating him. I do like that contrast, like that uh, crescendo and diminuendo of like what like family yeah because michael didn't understand like michael did not have that same idea uh, of familial love that his father had and i think also like as a person who went into gangsterism uh against it like with some preconceived notions it's not surprising that he like he missed out on what it actually means to be a, a gangster. Well, what ultimately put or Michael a... into his position as godfather was this shame for not being there for his father when his father was gunned down. Right. Right. And so his entire experience as Don is saying, I'm sorry, daddy. And like you said, it's all about putting his father his love for his father who was no longer there above everything. Like he has to maintain what his father has built and he is going to do that with a clenched fist. But I do think that there is something to like, like the way that the second movie ends is with seeing the family at the table and seeing Michael. Flashback. Yeah. And seeing Michael, he has just signed up to go into the military and he has opted out of the Corleone family business. And he had this thing in his head of, I am never going to be what my father is. And then when he found him himself in the place of, okay, now I have to be my father, he's still playing off of this preconceived notion of what his father was. And he saw his father as a tough guy, as a decision maker, and as a guy who did not value life. What he didn't see about his father was the importance of family, the importance of distributing the power, and... Um, using the power to create community. Yeah. And and then like and that preconceived notion is what what isolated him ultimately. So so that's the Godfather three trilogy. Yeah. The Psycho three trilogy. I'll be brief. <laughs> um, Psycho. Brian, two. you did not see Psycho two this week, did you? No, I, no, I didn't. I didn't see that yet. But I, will. I know that because I've been tracking your letterbox, <laughs> sir. Uh, letterbox doesn't tell the whole truth. Some people watch movies and, and never log them yeah. on a letterbox. I know Brian's like not like you. Yes. Um, Psycho two is not directed by Hitchcock. It is directed by. Uh, uh, Richard Franklin, yeah. and it is written by Tom Holland, who directed Fright Night, the OG, and, and Richard Franklin directed Patrick and, and a bunch of cool Australian horror films. And um, mm-hmm. the other writer is Robert Block. Well, Robert Block. No, he came based up with the characters. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, the yeah. book writer. It's okay. just Tom Holland on the screenplay. Um, but 
Psycho 2 is kind of fun because there is a definite Scooby Doo vibe <laughs> oh, where <really? laughs> um, there is a there is someone who is meddling and uh, but then she's she's somehow manages to be the the guy who takes their mask at the end of Scooby Doo off and blames the meddling kids but she's also uh, the meddling kid. Uh, well, I would I d- don't don't spoil it for Brian because I I feel like <laughs> I thought I was being pretty no, you, cryptic. No, you did a good job. You did a good job. I just don't want to go any further into talking about what Psycho 2 ultimately is about. Right. Okay. But there is a playfulness to it. Yes. Um I do end up like it's not like this great it's not work psycho. of suspense or anything. Okay. But I think that it's like a fun little uh, fanfic of what would happen to Norman Bates. And like he he got off essentially in some people's perspective with the insanity plea. And so now, well, he's no longer insane, it's time to reintroduce him to regular life. And some people are gonna be opposed to that. Right, right. And they may take measures, unanticipated measures, to address that wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's what Psycho 2 is about. I, I, I thought it was fun. I think mm-hmm. coming off of the conversation that Brian started last week about really appreciating Anthony Perkins' performance and the character yeah. of Norman Bates and the tragedy of Norman Bates uh, as this broken uh, psyche. And victim. And victim. I think uh, Psycho 2 does an, an even better job of making you feel for that human being. And the ending of Psycho 2 is a tremendous tragedy, even within its Scooby-Doo confines. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And I, I, I can see Brian, as you did, I mean, you like you liked Psycho 2. I did. Yeah, and I can see Brian really enjoying Psycho 2 as well. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look for that uh, this this week. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put that on my list with uh, with Vertigo. Vertigo and Psycho yeah. 2, I'll have that be a double feature. <laughs> well, if you're a completist, you should go on to watch Psycho 3. <laughs> Though, it is, by a by a mile, the worst of the Psycho films. <laughs> um, it, this one came out in 1986, so this is three years after Psycho 2. And it is directed by Anthony Perkins. Which is fascinating. And oh, wow. you definitely get the vibe that he did not love all of the little details that were added in Psycho 2. And so he kind of wanted to retcon some of the details about Norman Bates' life of Psycho 2, which I always think is like an interesting move. And then he also- He Rise of skywalker that last Jedi. <laughs> yes, yes he did. Uh... And then um, also, it's clear that he wanted to show more facets of the Norman Bates character. Yeah. He wanted to lean a little bit harder into the sexuality of Norman Bates. Like, uh, at, in the first film, there is definitely that peeping Tom element. But when it comes to the actual crimes, uh, it, he does it in a very asexual, removed fashion. Um, especially because he takes the takes on the persona of mother. His, his mother. Um, but in Psycho 3... Those lines between is the is him as his mother the criminal is Norman Bates the accomplice or is he also a criminal? Those lines are blurred a little bit more. You get a completely wild young Jeff Fahey performance yeah. as oh. this the skis bag so Dwayne good. Duke. I love it. Who comes to work at uh, the Bates Motel? Oh, and and Dennis Franz is that type of character in Psycho Two. So yeah. Dennis Franz has a gnarly, disgusting role in Psycho Two, and Jeff Fahey it, it basically fulfills that role in Psycho Three. But I think that he is like he's he's in more of the movie. He's a more complete yes, character. Yes. Um, there's also uh, a kind of 
a new hot blonde with a pixie cut. She's the one who screams, there is no God. Yeah, and in her, <laughs> the character is Ma- uh, Maureen Coyle, uh, who is a was a novice nun, be, <laughs> but because of some, uh, obviously an identity crisis with her relationship to God, <laughs> because she is in her habit, and well, and she's um, she's got the feeling. She's got sexual desires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like that's a spoiler. Oh, sorry. Um, but, but yes, she. There is a tragedy, and she has, and she feels like she doesn't want to be a nun anymore. So she runs off, ends up at the base motel. I, I liked it. I'm still gonna come down on the side of I'm glad I watched it. But there is a uh, Jeff Fahey. Sexy, sex scene? Oh, yeah. Is that a sex scene? It's definitely a sexual scene. He likes his lamps. He does. There was a lot of lamp play in his <laughs> foreplay, which was unanticipatable. So I guess I'm I'm laying the groundwork for you guys as the listeners to imagine what does lamp play mean in a sexual <laughs> Tune in to find thing. out. I would say that visually Psycho 3 is also interesting. What Anthony yeah. Perkins is doing and the way that he chooses to shoot mother with the wig in light and the face in complete blackness is really cool. And you definitely mm. see him trying to swede some of Hitchcock's yes. um, inventive yes. camera angles and all of that and, stuff. And some work and some don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, oh. like the the um the attempt is there and the homage is definitely felt. And to me, I feel like I learned more about Anthony Perkins as a person who had lived with this character and had definite had a definite perspective on him on that character that he wanted represented yeah. on film. And uh and so I feel like I learned a lot about maybe some things I didn't want to know about Anthony Perkins to tell you the truth. I, I don't know, like because Psycho One is so well regarded and was a cultural phenomenon and shifted cinema and culture uh, when it came out. Psycho Two, twenty some odd years later, was it 1983? Yeah. Uh, you know, Psycho Two comes out. And it's in the middle of the slasher era. Yeah. Uh, it, it, is, it is definitely embracing the gore a little bit more. You get to see the blade penetrate skin you get to quite see a tits. bit. You get to see tits. Um, the sexuality is much more aggressive. It is dismissed. Both of them are dismissed as cash-ins. And I, I think that's unfair. I, I think mm. there is there is value in both of them. And there's a lot of value in Psycho too. And I think that I can understand an actor who has lived with a character and really gave the the defining performance of his career, certainly, in Psycho 1, and then to go, like, to have definite feelings of, this is who Norman Bates is. He was, a, yes, he started on Hitchcock's page, or, well, started on the page of Robert Block, but I have now lived in his mind. I have now f- seen his perspective with my very own eyes. And I want, I want that represented. Yeah. I want, like, I, this is who Norman Bates yeah. is. I, I, I can understand that kind of artistic corrective impulse. It's kind of cool. It's cool. It makes, so the, it makes but the ego of it is what I find yeah. really, really enticing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The uh, what's the um, have either of you guys seen that show, The Bates Motel? Isn't that supposed to be a prequel to the original yeah, film with uh, Vera Farmiga in it? Yeah. I've seen the first batch of episodes. I wasn't really into it. I love Vera Farmiga, but I couldn't really connect with the series. Okay, uh, I've heard well, I've heard mixed things on it for the most part. Uh, okay. maybe one day, maybe one day. There's so much yeah. crap. When it comes oh to yeah, TV. I know, I know. Yeah. But I don't. I don't even think that's even airing anymore. I think that's no. done. But I do yeah, remember they had that that series, and I, I know they said it was supposed to take place before um, the the first Psycho. So I was yeah, just Norman's like a teenager in it. Okay, I'm, so it deals with that. Okay, I'm honestly not curious. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen enough of the Bates Motel. <laughs> I don't know. If it was good, I'd be into it. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But true, based on what I'd seen, I wasn't like really pulled in. Okay, okay. Sounds good, sounds good. That's all you got for your uh, Weekend Dork, Lisa? Yep, thank you, okay. Brian. 
<laughs> oh, thank you. For your time and your attention. <laughs> no problem at all. Anytime, anytime. Thank um, you. Uh, Brad, what you got? What you got? Uh, I'm going to, you know, I've been watching the same films that Lisa's been watching. We also rewatched all the Indiana Jones films, but I want to save that conversation with you. We're, we're going to have an yeah. Instagram live chat about the Indiana Jones films. Yeah. Um, uh, we also watched, I feel like there was another special movie that we watched in the early in the week and I can't remember but that's okay uh, what I want to talk about is more <laughs> Star Wars the Clone Wars uh, I'm still oh, yeah. riding high off of uh, what has se- what season 7 has been on Disney Plus uh, uh-huh. and it just drives me crazy that mo- more people in the world are not watching Star Wars Clone Wars uh, because it has just been so damn good This past week's episode was part one in a four-part series that's going to conclude the seventh season, which is The Siege of Mandalore. Uh, And and basically what the gist is, if you remember from Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, the film opens with Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker in their Jedi fighters uh, attacking a Separatist ship that is uh, run by General Grievous and he's got he's kidnapped the Emperor and they're having a battle high above the skies of Coruscant, right? Yes. So while that is going on, Ahsoka Tano, uh, the, one of the many uh, characters from the Clone Wars and I would say the defining character from the Clone Wars, she has joined up with a resistance band of Mandalorian rebels who are taking back their planet from the clutches of the crime lord known as Maul, a.k.a. Darth Maul, the guy who got sliced in half by Obi-Wan Kenobi at the end of The Phantom Menace. Uh, You have to watch Clone Wars, but Maul is alive. He has robot legs. Uh, It's really cool. You should watch Clone Wars. But season seven, building to the, 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 the siege of Mandalore, Ahsoka Tano has been struggling with her relationship with the Jedi Order. Uh, In season five, she left the Jedi Order, rejecting her um, acceptance as a Jedi Master because of events that there was a Jedi Temple bombing. The Jedi thought she may have been responsible. She was framed for it. And when the Jedi turned their backs on her, she saw that these guys aren't infallible they are capable of mistakes and maybe this holy war that they are waging for the chancellor against the separatists uh is neglecting other aspects of the galaxy and in season seven she's seeing how the rest of the galaxy sees the jedis as puppets for the republic um and of course those citizens are right you know, because the Clone Wars is a great fabricated lie mm-hmm. orchestrated by the Emperor. These 10 years of, of battles have just been positioned so that the Chancellor could k- get an iron grip over the Republic and turn the Republic into the Empire. That is still the wildest, most emasculating plot twist of all time. And the fact that the prequels never really dealt with that. Right. Yeah. It was really, really frustrating. And what's wonderful about Star Wars The Clone Wars is that's exactly what it's about. It's about how Yoda and Mace Windu and Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, were blind to the true evil that was standing right next to them in Darth Sidious and Anakin Skywalker, who then becomes Darth Vader. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like it just turns the Jedi into tools. Well, they're chumps. They're yeah. chumps. They're they're not heroes at all. Um, they are great failures, and that that's what I always wanted the movies to end up, you know, building towards. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I was kind of hoping, you know, we would see after the the Last Jedi is that even when Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker maybe redeems himself, at least in the eyes of Luke Skywalker at the end of Return of the Jedi and throws the Emperor down that Death Star shaft, Yeah. Luke then becomes like, well, I can now bring balance to the Force. I can be the guy. But what does Luke do? He does the same mistakes that Obi-Wan does, yeah. you know, because he did not learn. And he creates another villain in the child next to him, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And 
what what Ray should have done is like you know this this whole light side dark side thing. You know, I'm balance of the force. It's not a black or white issue. You know, like that's what that's what should have happened. It shouldn't be like actually I'm Ray Skywalker. But hell, I would not take a Skywalker name. You know, I'm not going to change my name to Brad Hitler and, <laughs> and, and turn and, and, and make Hitler into a good name. No, no, I'm not Brad Hitler. I'm Brad Gullickson. Yeah, uh, and I wouldn't want to be Brad Skywalker either. Um, yeah. and, 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 but what I'm loving about Star Wars The Clone Wars is how Ahsoka Tano is having her eyes opened and she's not a Jedi anymore she does have a couple of really rad uh, lightsabers, dual lightsabers that she can go against Maul and she can help these people because what she has discovered is she has to she's like Captain America, right? she has to go by her heart, she has to go by her gut she sees wrong in the world and she goes, maybe I can help that wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go where that wrong is and see if I can help. Whereas the Jedi, they're like, look, we can't deal with Mandalore. Like, I understand that Darth Maul is, you know, controlling this government and killing all these people. But we got to go save our chancellor. You know, we got to go help our people. And we couldn't break those treaties anyway. So we got to follow our treaties. And let's just stick with this separatist war. That's, we got to win one war at a time. And Ahsoka Tana's like, well, you go have fun rescuing your uh, chancellor, a.k.a. your emperor. Uh, I'm going to go actually help the people. And that's what season seven has been building to. And that's where we are at now in Star Wars, the Clone Wars, yeah. is Ahsoka Tano and this small band of uh, uh, Mandalorian rebels. Plus... Anakin did break up the 501st Air uh, uh, Clone Trooper Division, so Captain Rex and his troops split and go with the Sokotano to Mandalore to f to free to free that planet. Um, now, we also know that more stuff happens, and it's not necessarily a happy ending uh, at the end of the Clone Wars. I'll be curious to see how they resolve the Mandalore battle, especially knowing where Maul goes in Star Wars Rebels. Uh, and Maul does finally have his confrontation with Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, in the sands of Tatooine uh, in uh, Star Wars Rebels, uh, the episode Twin Sons, which is an amazing episode of television. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Ahsoka Tano finally does have her battle with Darth Vader in the Rebels episode Twilight of the Apprentice, which may be the greatest Star Wars episode ever. Uh, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Because the series is a series, and because maybe not as many people are watching it or paying as close of attention to Clone Wars and Rebels, they're able to do things in that show that the movies never could. Uh, and, and they can judge the heroes a little harshly in ways that the movies never could. I just love the idea of storytelling with goalposts, where it's just like, we have, like, it's not up to us where this story is ending up, right, right. but it is up to us, this character and their perspective of it. Yeah, like what's so awesome about the Clone Wars, right, especially coming back to it after the show had supposedly already ended, was we all know the ending of this story from a galactic standpoint and from the standpoint of the Skywalkers, right? We know the Emperor is gonna take over. We know that the Empire is going to rise. Uh, you know, so the Clone Wars is, is free from surprise and in being free from surprise, it's it actually can speak to the narrative that was being constructed by George Lucas in ways that George Lucas never could. Right. So and I think pretty that, badass. I think that the the f major foibles in this in the storyline, I feel in the Star Wars storyline where uh, the the meaning of Jedi went from this empowering thing to this embarrassing thing. Like, like it's a result of Lucas's tremendous blind spots yeah. on this story that he created. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's and so to point at those blind spots and go like, I don't think like, like now you've created the, this world where this tremendous injustice exists yeah and nobody's talking about it and nobody's pointing at it so yeah. very interesting it's very interesting still I, won't make me watch clone wars though yeah you, you still can't do it uh, you still can't do it not, um not interested I, I would also say that these last four episodes the cgi the, the animation yeah. is, is stepped up big time and i feel like 
the, these four episodes were running to a point where this this would have played in theaters at some point. You know, there would have been some fathom event where we could all go and watch all four of these episodes on the big screen. Uh, but because of you know everything that's going on, we can't do that. But they look amazing, and you know, you know when this this episode started, it starts unlike any other uh, Clone Wars episode. It starts with the green logo of Lucasfilm, and it's like you're about to watch a movie. And rather than hearing the Clone Wars theme come in, you hear jo uh, John Williams's. Uh, Star Wars fanfare kick off these four episodes and you're like, oh, oh wow. my God, this is a movie. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty great. And Brian, 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 I'm yeah, going to do it. I'm, I'm putting together my curated list of episodes because I just need to get you th through the the bullet points of seasons one and two and then we can get you into you know the rest of season three season four season five six and seven the, i say seven you need to watch every episode but i don't know if you necessarily yeah. need to do that for every episode uh in clone wars because i was going to ask you is it possible because i I'm, I'm intrigued by it and i mean currently right now i don't have disney plus i canceled but i am going to re-up probably hopefully um soon but um, I was going to ask, can you just watch season seven or do you need some of that backstory from the previous six seasons? I think you can watch season seven by itself and enjoy it. What you will miss is the tension between Ahsoka Tano and Anakin Skywalker uh, because, you know, Anakin did not have her back. But mm. you know that now because I just told you that. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, I, was, you, I would still like to see that kind of played out as well. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. I, I, what I want to do is I want to curate a list, and at the very least, I think you should watch all the Darth Maul episodes because yeah. they're just really cool. Uh, and actually, I would say all the Savage Opress—that's Darth Maul's brother all the Savage Opress episodes leading up to the rediscovery of Maul, that he's mm. alive. Okay. Uh, and then I would have you watch everything in season seven, and then I'd wa have you watch certain Rebels episodes. So this, now you said this is like a, a four-part, kind of like a four-part miniseries. So yeah. is this part of season seven? It or is. Or is this something is. that, so these are like the last four episodes It's the last the four season. episodes. Basically, the way that the seventh season is operated is that the first four episodes are its own little movie. The next four episodes are its own little movie. And then the final four episodes are its own little movie. People gotcha. were a little lukewarm on the middle four episodes, which was about Ahsoka Tano hanging out with the Martez sisters uh, and trying to like escape the, the Pike crime syndicate. And mm. while I kind of understand that there, those episodes were maybe not as exciting as the first four or what these final four episodes are going to do, those middle four episodes go a long way in defining how Ahsoka Tano is feeling before the Siege of Mandalore and how she looks at her time with the Jedi. Uh, and, and I think they are crucial episodes and they, they reveal how the rest of the galaxy looks at the heroes of Star Wars. So do you think, kind of moving away from... Um moving away from the Clone Wars animated show, moving forward with Star Wars, and especially with Disney Plus is looking at, as far as like some of their live action series, and we, we know that Ahsoka Tana is going to be in, um, or at least have uh, an appearance in uh, Mandalorian Season 2. What do you think, do you have any ideas, or what's your speculations as far as like any plans as far as using that character? Do you think they might fill in the gaps with uh, going back uh, into that time period, especially like seeing um, uh, seeing Darth Maul uh, during uh, Solo uh, at the end of Solo? Um, do you think they could play around with stuff like that? Like, what, well, what I mean, Mandalorian takes place after Return of the Jedi, yeah, and so yeah. Darth Maul or Maul. Because he's, uh, he's no longer a Darth. He died in uh, yeah, Rebels. the third season of Rebels. Uh, like yeah. I said, it's the Twin Suns episode, and that episode is so freaking great. Um, but what I have a very specific question that I would like explored around the character of Ahsoka Tano, which I will not say here because it will okay. be a big spoiler for what happens to her character in Rebels. 
Um, There is stuff that goes down with her character, specifically after her fight with Darth Vader in the Twilight of the Apprentice episode, that I would like fulfilled. And I would love, I would love The Mandalorian to explore that in some way or lead to a spinoff series where we just have Ahsoka Tano uh, and, and watching her life. Because mm-hmm. there are some major gaps that happen with that character uh, after Rebels. And so in between the the original trilogy, in between New Hope, yeah. Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. And like you could do a whole series around those gaps. and But it, it deals with some really funky, fantastical stuff that I'm not sure people who are just bred on the films and what they've seen in The Mandalorian would be prepared for. Okay, okay. That, that's because uh, not knowing any of some of the, the history of, of the character, just having, you know, uh, Rosario Dawson cast it as Ahsoka Tano, um, part of me feels like they're trying to possibly spin that off into her own series, whether that takes place after Return of the Jedi and Mandalorian or if they kind of go back to fill in those gaps like you're saying. But part of me feels like because she seems like such a fan favorite character, that they might be trying to spin off something to have her own series. I, I don't know. That's just, you know, my like, conjecture. But For me, I would like to see her confront the legacy of her Jedi Master, Anakin Skywalker, at, because at the end of her duel with Vader in Rebels, a light bulb starts to go off. Mm-hmm. But we never really get to see her deal with, gotcha. oh, what now? <laughs> okay. okay. Sky guy, Anakin Skywalker, that my buddy, uh, he turned into space Hitler. Mm, I see. <laughs> like, okay. okay. <laughs> I want that resolved. And it's never going to be resolved in a satisfying way because Darth Vader's story is resolved by Luke Skywalker. You know, okay. if you if you are only watching her relationship with Anakin through the lens of Clone Wars, it feels like Darth Vader's story should be wrapped up with her, but that's not what happens, right? You know. So. Interesting, man. It's fascinating, man. It's fascinating. I mean, when you look at everything as a whole outside of the movies, man, it, it it's great. I mean, like you say, it's just great, you know, saga storytelling. But, yeah, uh, I just think I just think Clone Wars is so so special, and what, and, and you know, like. I was disappointed when I heard that Filoni was coming back to do Clone Wars Season 7 because even though Clone Wars Season 6 was barely even really a season and the show was canceled uh, unceremoniously, you know, they went on and made Rebels and continued the stories of Captain Rex and Ahsoka Tano through that series while also introducing a bunch of cool people like Kanan and Ezra and Sabine and and, and, and lots of characters that I like a lot. Um, but But, you know... We, we saw where Captain Rex and, and Ahsoka Tana go for the most part. So going back to these characters at the tail end of the Clone Wars just didn't appeal to me. But then Filoni's like, yo, Brad, <laughs> check this out. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm glad you came back and did this. Uh, and so, That's yeah, cool. yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's cool. pretty special. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm looking forward to to, to checking that stuff out and getting introduced to some new things through uh, through Star Wars. Uh, anything else you got? Uh, no. I mean, we're hitting an hour mark. I, I think I'm gonna put it put a pin in it there. I will say okay. that I read another manga this week that I really really enjoyed called The Way of the House Husband, okay. which was about a yakuza who gave up the yakuza life to become a house husband and take care of his wife while she's working and. He learns, uh, you know, the joys and the pains of dealing with a rumba. And uh, it's really great. (laughs) Okay. Okay. That sounds interesting. The Way Um, of the House Husband. Way of the House Husband. I like that. I like that title. Um, So, yeah, My Weekend Dork, it pretty much been a lot of rewatches. I did check out a new um, um, series that premiered this past Friday on Netflix. But I'll kind of run through. I won't be too long. But I did a lot of rewatches. And going to your point, too, Brad, I did watch... um, the Indiana Jones uh, tr- trilogy. I actually yesterday I watched Temple of Doom and Last Crusade, and um, as of this recording now, I still have to watch the fourth one. Which that's I may correct. Do that tom- yeah, I may do that tomorrow. Um, so after I watch, um, what's the fourth one called again? King <laughs> Crystal, Crystal Skull. Crystal Skull. <laughs> 
after I watch that, then we will definitely um, kind of break down the Indiana Jones trilogy. And I, I wanted to do that because I know there's a big fandom around Indiana Jones, almost to the degree of like Star Wars. There's, there's, there's people who love Indiana Jones, and I just haven't been that type. I haven't been able to kind of be a part of that fandom. I, I love the movies and love the characters, but I, I don't know. I just don't have that same energy i guess for for the indiana jones franchise and i kind of want to you know maybe uh have a little therapy session and see why i don't have that love (laughs) for indiana jones as much as other people do so maybe you can help me with that brad (laughs) well i'm gonna do my best (laughs) <laughs> but um so yeah i watched those thoroughly enjoyed it so i can't wait to talk about that and then i actually watched um a couple of rewatches that i watched uh one was the lone ranger uh oh, from wow. 2013 i've still <laughs> I never seen it oh really yeah and it's oh. it's like one of brad's talking points i mean i, I know yeah i, I know. mean I, brad I know. has distinct and descriptive feelings about that film i do i do i do How'd it go well, for I you, do, Brian? I do I do remember you saying that you actually enjoyed that film, correct? If I'm not mistaken. Uh the last time I watched it, I did. I did. Uh you know, like it's okay. got, it's problematic. Um yeah. yes. Yeah. But uh Yeah. I I, like- I, I, I um I don't know, kind of in the vein of uh, one thing that kind of stood out with me with the Indiana Jones movies, um, it's that it's, it's that sense of adventure. And I would say Lone Ranger has that specifically in the third act. It does kind of have that sense of adventure to it, um, especially in the, in the way Gore Verbinski kind of stages a lot of the action sequences. Um, but yeah, I think there are certain things that are kind of problematic, specifically, I guess you could say, with Johnny Depp playing Tonto. <laughs> um, but um, I, I I enjoyed it. I, I I thought I thought overall it was a fun. It's a fun film and definitely a fun experience and the cinematography and the set decoration yeah. is just so lavish and as a western it just feels you you can feel the money on screen yeah and i think that goes yeah. a lot to jerry bruckheimer um where you see every dollar on the screen and to do that for a western i was like okay how do you show that and he he proved me wrong. You could definitely see the money spent on that movie. Uh, like, if you but, go back and you watch the Pirates of the Caribbean films, uh, also directed by Gore Verbinski, they're yeah. weird pirate ghost stories, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and for the most part, they work. I, I, I'm a big fan of the entire trilogy. Uh, the pirate films after the trilogy, less so. Um, mm. But, like, Lone Ranger, it's, an, a, it's a gargantually expensive Western, which you just don't see see yeah and i was gonna say anymore but ever right like it's such an expensive movie they they don't make westerns like this they they really don't it's also (laughs) a really weird movie and i can see why people go like yeah no thank you what's the deal with these cannibal rabbits like (laughs) it's a very very strange film but I see that all as a bonus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 out there, but it's it, if you if you can kind of go with it, it, it can be an enjoyable ride. Um, so yeah, I, I I recommend Lone Ranger. Another movie that I watched rewatched was um, also from 2013 was Oblivion, the oh. Joseph Joseph Kaczynski uh, Tom Cruise movie with Olga Karolinko. Morgan Freeman and uh, Jamie Lannister, Nikolai Coaster Waldo. Um, I remember seeing this movie in 2013 with Darren, and uh, Darren actively does not like this movie. I know, and I know, and I uh, wish he was on the podcast because I don't, I don't want to speak for him or these have him defend himself, but I, he'll he'll tell you himself that he just does not like this movie, and I, I had mixed feelings about the film, and I haven't really revisited the film in in many years but I do have it on Blu-ray and I have a digital copy of it and part of me was like I was kind of going through my uh, my movies I was like you know what let me put Oblivion on, Oblivion on. and um, I kind of got sucked into it I, I got su- and again going to uh, a, a director like Joseph Kaczynski coming off of Tron Legacy um, when you talk about like I talked about with Lone Ranger when you talk about something like uh, set design and yeah. um that movie has that in space, just the way that they film a lot of like this the apocalyptic world of uh, uh of 
you know, San Francisco, like these bridges and stadiums and just everything, just the world building in that, I thought was just absolutely fascinating. Um, the twist of the story, which I won't give too much away if many people haven't seen it, but I actually thought that rewatching it was really uh, effective as far as like, you know, what they call the scavs, mm -hmm. the scavengers that have kind of ravaged the world after um, the invasion um, and how it takes that and kind of twists us on his head. Um, I really, really, I really, really enjoyed a lot of that, and that was what my opening quote was from, uh, from Melissa Leo's character, uh, Sally. You know, are you an effective team? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I really enjoyed that movie, and um, I don't know. I guess you could say I'm an oblivion defender because I think there's many people that don't really look at that movie uh, fondly. Um, I love the score by M83, mm -hmm. and um, Kaczynski works with this another. Um, uh, jo uh, Joseph Trapanese, who worked with Daft Punk on um, the Tron Legacy score, uh, Joseph Trapanese also worked with M83 on this score, and he also did uh, some some work on the Raid, the uh, the Raid Redemption score, and he just has this I don't know kind of almost in the same vein of like a Junkie XL. Uh, Joseph Trapanese knows how to bring in like these these really kind of um, you know the these beats and electronica beats um into the score that i just i i love i love it. even with the raid score i thought he did some great work in that but um yeah i i enjoy oblivion so i need to revisit it i was a little lukewarm on it when it came out i, I was definitely yeah. disappointed i think is the word i would use yeah um, yeah. But but it's time for me to revisit it, and I like him as a director. And you know, I really like Tron Legacy, and I'm excited about Top Gun Two when we get to see it. That's right, he is directing Top Gun Two. So yeah, I mean, um, yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Um, so what else did I check out? So I talked about that. Um, so I guess I'll get into the series that I watched. Now there was a series on Netflix that just debuted on. Uh, this past Friday, the 17th, and it's called um, Hashtag Black AF, and it stars Kenya Barris. Kenya Barris is the, um, is the showrunner and creator of some of some network television show uh, Blackish. So he created Blackish, Grownish, Mixedish. I think those are the three shows that he's that he's created, and um, it's kind of a meta show. It's it's it. it when I watched the first episode, it reminded me, it seemed like he was trying to do a take on of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, mm -hmm. where you have uh, Larry David, the creator of Seinfeld, and you're kind of watching him go throughout his life, and people know him as Larry David, the creator of Seinfeld, so <clears throat> the way the way this show is, is framed, where Kenya Barris is um you know you know that he is the creator of the show blackish and you know he's living in la with his wife played by um rashida jones and they have six kids <laughs> which i don't know if this is based on his real life but um they have six kids and they live in la and they kind of live this really affluent life and their second oldest child uh drea is trying to get into film school so as like one of her thesis projects um to get into film school i think usc she's doing the documentary about her family and so the show is kind of framed as the documentary that we are watching of her like recording her family and we're just kind of like a fly on the wall capturing her life so it's kind of done in the style of like the office or parks and rec but in a way where it's like a lot of times you can actually see the camera crew around like recording them and i think i think huh. it's kind of i think it's kind of cool the way they kind of frame the show like that um and even when they, they do their little confessionals and stuff like that you can like even see them like you know sitting with the lighting and everything so it's kind of cool but the show it, it it has that dry humor in the way that Curb Your Enthusiasm has, and it was and I like Curb I, I like Curb a lot, especially like some of the later seasons. I yeah. haven't gone I haven't gone back like since they kind of revised it and brought it back. I haven't gone back. Yeah, to neither watch have it. I. I need to do that because I loved Curb yeah. Your Enthusiasm for a period there. 
Yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of people talk about Larry Day because Larry Davis' character is kind of this kind of... Uh, Monster. Prim- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Kenya Barris in uh, Black AF is... Um, it's the, kind of the same way. He's not necessarily a likable character. He's it sometimes seems unattentive as a father and a husband. And I don't know if they're trying to play that for laughs, but sometimes it just, I don't know, it, it doesn't work for me all the time, especially when it comes to the comedic aspect of it. And it seems like they're trying to be a little bit like that Larry David type character. Mm. Um, I, I, just thought, I, I also thought it was just interesting because before I watched the show, um, there's, there was this big uh, thing on Twitter, which I didn't even know was going on because, you know, I, I'm not in the know, you know, with everything that's trending on Twitter. But some of uh, some of the things I kind of saw in my feed was a lot of people talking about Rashida Jones and people, oh. people didn't know that she yeah. was black <laughs> or, ha- or half black. And I think a lot of that was coming to light because of this show, um, because she plays Kenya Barris's husband and, you know, she does play like a mixed person. Um, and, you know, they have these kids and, you know, that's, that's part of the show. The show really is talking about this, this black family that lives this affluent life, but they still have to deal with a lot of the racism that comes, you know, in everyday life, even being a family that, you know, lives lavishly and has a lot of money and is able to, you know, afford, you know, a, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the luxuries that some of other people can't afford. They still go through some of the same things that, you know, um, you know, other black people go through and it, it does that in a very comedic way, but I just thought it was funny that, and I guess if you didn't know that Rashida Jones was Quincy Jones's daughter, then, you know, maybe people wouldn't know that she was half black, know, but yeah. <laughs> so weird. I just, I just you thought that, that was funny. People that, are weird. Yeah. I just thought, yeah, I thought that that was funny. Um, uh, that that was something that was trending on Twitter. I was like, where is this coming from? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but she's great. I, I love Rashida Jones. Oh, I mean, awesome. even, it's even from Parks and Rec. And she's really good in this show. And like I said, the, the show is hit or miss for me. But at the end, of, there's eight episodes. And they run about 30, 40 minutes. Um, and there's there's a scene between her and Kenya Barris where they're kind of having some trouble in their marriage. And they kind of have this fight or this argument um, as far as, like, you know, like, Thing, you know where their marriage is and you know they feel like that they're competing against each other and it was a well written scene it was at the end of episode 6 mm, excuse me and it was a well written scene well acted and again it just it just felt real it felt authentic it felt like you know a real disagreement or argument that a couple would have and i just thought that 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 kind of sucked me into the show and it carries over into kind of like those last two episodes of the season. So, yeah, the the show, it, I, I, I like it, but I got some issues with it. But um, I, I, I think it's definitely worth a watch if you if you have the time. So, yeah, it's, it's on Netflix now, all, all episodes streaming. Uh, it's called Hashtag Black AF. Um, so, yeah, definitely check that out if you have the time. Uh, who doesn't nowadays? <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> um, I, and uh, from last week's episode, um, Insecure Yay! season four. Yeah, season four. And I want to ask you about that, Lisa, because I knew um, we were texting a little bit back and forth that you always you started watching the show. And um, so, but with season four, and I don't want to give too much. Please away. don't give too much away yeah. now that I am watching oh. and fully invested. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just say that it seems like this season, um, going from just this one episode, is really going to focus on the relationship of, or the friendship of Molly and Issa. Um, And how that friendship might be in trouble a little (gasps) bit. Um, That friendship is always in trouble. They are constantly (laughs) on the rocks, on the ins and outs. Lisa and I have watched almost all of the second season now by this point. Yes. So we've done nearly two seasons in one week. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I I, kind of want to segue into that a little bit, but um, I'm I'm enjoying to see where possibly season four is going to go. And I think that's interesting to kind of 
look at because the show deals on and I talked about this last week before you guys watched that the the show deals a lot with relationships but it also deals a lot with you know professional life and friendships and things of that nature and it seems like although they are still kind of going through relationship issues um I think the the center of the show has always been uh Molly and Issa and it's it feels like this season is really going to uh test that friendship Mm. Um and, and it's, I, I, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm nervous to see what that means or where that goes. Um, because they have this thing at the end of each episode called the wind down, where they bring on cast members and they talk about, you know, the episode and talk about you know the characters. So at the end of this episode, they were kind of talking about the writing process and what they were doing. Um, for this opening uh, episode of the season and they were just saying like you know like people talk about a lot of times like you can have relationships that break up but you can also have friendships that break up as well and they it, it feels like they want to explore that more this season and if it, it felt that way watching that episode mm. that you know they they might be dealing with you know a, a breakup of a friendship possibly so but uh interesting yeah, I, interesting. yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I, again, I, 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 when I was texting Lisa, I was telling her like I love the show, even though like a lot of the stuff with these characters frustrates me. But that's the beauty of drama. That's the beauty of of watching something like this is that you get invested, and the characters don't always make the right the right decisions or the best decisions. But um, you you still kind of uh, you're still endeared to to a lot of these characters when you follow them. And I love the look of the show, the music. But I, I wanted to ask you, Lisa. So I guess you and Brad. So you're about almost through season two. Uh, what are some of your thoughts that you've seen so far with the show? We're gonna lose Brad at any second <laughs> like I, I, I was thinking that I was like I was like I hope we don't but I I, I don't know but I might have way. to leave him in the dust because <laughs> he is in such profound discomfort while watching <laughs> these people make these decisions yeah so, so like yeah so there are like two ways we are removed from this show as human beings <laughs> one we are white people these are this is about black culture yeah. But also, Brad and I were never part of hookup culture. Tr- yeah, yeah. So, um, But I think that's what's interesting about it. I es- think that's what's... Because I would love to see what your perspective is from that. Right. And so, like, yeah. Because I don't know... Because to me, I feel like it's not showing hookup culture in this very aspirational life. Where mm-hmm. we look through it, look at it through our lens, and go like, "Well, clearly, the issue is you keep sleeping with all of these people." But I don't know if it's because, especially like, let's talk about Molly. So Molly yeah. wants out. She wants out of hookup culture at this point in her life, um, at, at season two, where she really wants the idea uh, that she sees in her parents of you get yeah. married, you have a perfect relationship, and you stay together. Now, she's just figured out some information about her her, uh, her, her dad and her parents' <laughs> relationship that has messed with this kind of foundational idea that she's had. Mm-hmm. Um, but, she, like, to us, where we, we go like, oh, well... Through our limited perspective, we go like, well, if that's what you want, then you have to stop sleeping with all of these people. But that's because we're coming at at, with this profound bias. And I would love to see a character represented who um, hookup culture is really serving them and really Mm. helping, like, where they're not walking through this life going like, I like I want out like to to them like the next level like they're looking it's they're looking to graduate from hookup culture where I feel like that might not necessarily be what what they want I have no idea and, yeah. and this it's, is a, this is a similar issue that I had with watching girls where I eventually oh, had okay. to stop watching girls because I couldn't understand why people at at their at their age would uh, and girls have the extra layer of being super drinky. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. where it really came down to a vomit scene where I'm just like, I can't take it anymore. As much as I, like, I personally love the relationship drama. And I love to see Issa be up and be down and be Lawrence and be Daniel and... Like I'm compl- like I love that as much as it makes me cringe, yeah. and I'm just like white knuckling it through so many episodes. <laughs> I can't take it. Brad cannot take it, you know. So, so I I feel like once we get through season three, which will probably season happen, two, season well season two, but then also season oh, yeah. three, mm-hmm. yeah, to where we can catch up and then we're we're locked in with Brian. I definitely yeah. want to use a weekend dork segment to really talk about like insecure insecure and really get okay. into yeah. maybe some spoilery because territory. i love the characters right. and i love the performances and it's so the writing yeah. is so and, sharp and, and so funny it's, but yeah. it's yeah. also weird to go like this is a tw- like 22 minutes 25 minutes an episode generally you go like this is about the funny hahas but there are like Episodes that are 25 minutes and devastating. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing that I love about the show. It's like, it's extremely funny and they have, and some of the characters are hilarious, but it leaves you devil. And that was the one thing about this new season with uh, the season premiere of episode four is that the way it ended, it just left me with like this this terrible feeling. I was when the when the episode ended. I was like, "Well, shit, that's a bummer." Yeah, <laughs> you know. And it's um, but I, I like the ebbs and flows of that, where you can get those laughs and you can follow these characters through their life and what they're doing. Um, but I I agree. Like, and the whole thing with my and I like the character of Molly, even though she does make a lot of bad decisions. But even going to your point, and I I know you said you want to you know save a lot of that, but it, I I just there's so much I love about the right. show. But and, and I just think that the whole thing with between her and Dro is just that yeah that shit was just wrong. And I I definitely because I knew that the moment that she went uh, went for that 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 was going to ruin their friendship because they had a friendship since they were kids or since they were in high school. And, you know, the fact of, you know, the type of marriage he has and and all this stuff, I was just like, I was just like, Molly, this this ain't what you want. Right. But, you know. But I I, I would like to see, like, I have watched that. Like, so that's the exact point where I'm at. So I haven't seen, like, is there going to be some fallout in Dro's marriage, even though that okay. they have they have an open marriage, like we've heard from his perspective. Right. Yeah. And, exactly. But yeah. Even like f- open marriages, they do have all types of contentions that depend on the couple, you know. And so, uh, so I haven't seen the fallout okay. of what okay. happens because of that, but I'm very intrigued. But yeah, yeah. if I want to keep the same kind of pace that I've been keeping, like, because um, the way our the rhythm of mine and Brad's uh, quarantine life is, like, <laughs> we get some work done in the morning, we come together for, while I'm making lunch, we'll watch some, we'll watch something. So right now our, like, lunch, lunch watch has been insecure, but okay. I, like, where, like, I feel like Brad is retreating into his phone more and more while in the last episode. On. I watched the entire episode over Twitter. I was like, I'm on Twitter. He's like, I can't. I can't, I can't he he it. literally can't take it, which I find so, so cute. It's so yeah. stressful. Yeah, yeah. It it, it 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 gets like that, and because yeah. Um, and I can't imagine watching it week to week. You say like the season premiere of uh, season four leaves you like devastated. At least, like, when you're blitzing through it, you can go, like, oh, that was devastating. Well, hopefully the next episode won't be as devastating. I know. I know. That, that, that's, the, that's the joy of being able to binge or watch things more uh, consecutively. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It, it's, I, I love it. And one of my favorite, like, uh, characters, um, side characters, is uh, Kelly. Mm-hmm. Um, I love she, Kelly. She is hilarious. <laughs> She is hilarious, but you can also tell that underneath that is a deep well of pain. And mm. the way that she she interacts and performs for her girlfriends and the and the front that she has and the the amount of energy that she has to keep up all of the time 
just to swat off some of the barbs of her friends. Oh, you know, okay. like she, she has a definite defense mechanism going on. I like the way I interpret her character. You know, maybe she is the most confident and the most secure, and I'm putting my bullshit on her. Well, but, there, there's some stuff in season three that I would love to get your um, get your opinion on between the dynamic between Kelly and Tiffany. Yeah. Um, that is going to play out more in season three. Uh, that does get it goes deeper into her character and their relationship. Yeah, because so. uh, definitely with um, the episode about Kelly's birthday oh, man. and how Issa is dealing with the recent breakup with mm, Lawrence. With Lawrence, yeah. Lawrence. And Molly is upset with with her because Issa served. Molly some realness that perhaps she wasn't like emotionally prepared for. Yeah. yeah and the way yeah. that they can be so into themselves that they cannot celebrate their friend in a way that I feel like Kelly deserves. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Especially because Kelly has invited them on this amazing weekend. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Like uh, but we see like Kelly and Tiffany as a unit, as a friend unit going like, like treating their bullshit like water off the duck's back. Like we're, uh, we don't care that you are, you know, yeah. alienating us. We are still going yeah. to have a good time. But, but like, there's also like this, some kind of, they, they also don't see eye to eye on every issue. So no, no, they they don't, they don't. Um, yeah, I can't wait till you see the season finale of uh, season two because, like I mentioned, that may be one of my favorite episodes, and I think it's because how the the structure, how how well directed it is, and the well written it is, and the structure of that show, um, and like the 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 final moments of that episode, like just really hit me personally because. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say I've been a part of hookup culture, but I mean, I, I've been through my fair share of relationships mm -hmm. in the past. And a lot of this stuff I definitely um, can identify with. And so so some of the stuff I, and that's the thing about I think I love about Issa Rae is like I think she's tapped into something that a lot of people, men and women, um, can relate and connect to on some level um, well, I that think, I think we've gone through. I think that. We're at it. I mean, I guess every age that we a person lives in, they go. There is something interesting. We like our culture is always cycling through different iterations. But I think that in terms, like we're at a new, we're at the cusp of a new cultural revolution where mm. Americans finally, since the founding of our fucking nation, are st <laughs> starting to try and buck off some of our puritanical predispositions and going like, hey, women are, like it started with sex in the city. Like, mm. hey, women characters can be sexual. It's not always yeah. the man who sleeps around. It's not always the man who yeah. is pursuing sex in an active way, not, yeah. not for an emotional need, but to serve their lust. Like women have lust. And so I think that, especially with the character of Molly, who is trying to live in both worlds. Do you know what I'm, I'm like having like a realization, like right at this moment, like, okay. I could not think of one fucking character's name in Godfather, like not one. <laughs> I was just like, I was just starting to make up Italian sounding names because I could not, but like I can name Every cut, every character of Insecure, and yeah. every and I'm going like detail. this one's Kelly. Oh yeah, the fingering <laughs> in the restaurant girl, right? Uh, that's right. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Where it's just like the Godfather does not like. That's also a world I do not identify with. I'm not an yeah, I'm not yeah. an immigrant. I'm not an Italian American. I am not a criminal, and but I cannot. I there. I also. I, I cannot you cannot emotionally relate to anybody. Anybody, really. Yeah. really. Mm, Where okay. with Insecure, even though I'm not a black woman, I am not a, I'm not part of hookup culture, I'm still yeah. so invested in yeah. each and yeah. every one of those characters. And I care more that, I, I care more what happens to them. Where I'm just like, <laughs> I'm know. kind of like, uh, I care what happens to Fredo. Just, <laughs> mostly because I think that um, 
he has extraordinary needs because of his pneumonia, yeah. his n- pneumonia oh, yeah. and infancy, mm-hmm. yeah. kind of starving parts of his brain. Uh, mm. You know, where I feel like um, he he was he was he just did not operate a, at the same speed of his brothers, which was and and it left him in the dust. I never made that connection with the pneumonia. Oh, you, that's that, oh. that's why that entire scene existed. I thought it was just showing him as like, well, he's always been the weak, the, the one. vulnerable one. But it's not that it's maybe not that he's always been the weak one. It's because of that incident that may have affected his capacity. Yeah. Shit. Oh, I see. I still have enlightening things to say about Godfather, but I just can't fake. I can't fake enthusiasm for the Godfather, and um, and I'm and I'm sorry. <laughs> it, I, but but it's the same with Brad talking about Clone Wars, where he can name every single character. He has mm. emotional stakes. Like to me, like Insecure is like my Clone Wars. <laughs> oh, no, okay. no, I'm fucking oh, nerdy. Oh, got it. Got you it, got know it, where it. I I just go like yeah. I'm not a Jedi, but I I still have fucking opinions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, it's- I'm uh, I'm 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 glad. It's always like anytime like something that I love and I, I recommend is always great. I, I think that's with anybody that recommends anything. Sure. You know, it's always great when somebody kind of you know connects with it as well to some degree. So I don't know. I'm I'm kind of happy that you. I that mean, I was that. nervous watching Insecure because I was like, what if I think this is bullshit? <laughs> I know. Like, I'm gonna tell one- Brian that. It's bullshit. That's one of the things that it is definitely not. No, no, it's definitely not. But like today, I exchanged some tweets back and forth with Matt Constantine, the Omega Dork, about the first yeah. two seasons of Clone Wars. Because he tweeted me, he's like, hey, Mouth Dork, uh, does this show get better? <laughs> I'm like, hey, you just got to get to season three, man. You just got to get to season three. But it is a vulnerable thing it sharing is. the things that you love, especially yeah, with yeah. me, who will just openly shit on something like <laughs> The true. Godfather. I didn't shit on The Godfather. No, I thought the it was. Godfather. It, like I just, but I just couldn't remember anybody's names, and all but, Italian actors of a certain age look the same to me, yeah. and that's not fair. Yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, uh, and you know, Brad and Darren have talked about this at length that you know we love what we love, yeah. and everybody's not going to respond to the same things, and it's just about you know, you know, sharing your opinion but being respectful of it, and you know, it's, you know, you share stuff with people if they connect with it, they do. If they don't, it's not going to stop you or me from loving what we love. But you know, it's just great when other people can kind of find something in that as well. So it's, it, I'm, I'm happy that you're enjoying yeah. it. So, but it's hard to like sometimes. Sometimes I don't figure out where my passions lie until I like really talk about it. Yeah, well, that's a great thing about uh, having a podcast, and everybody should have one. Join the absolutely come with us on this journey of self discovery. (laughs) And uh, hopefully, the some of the explicit uh, explicit sex scenes weren't too much because I I realized I realized when I rewatched it. Well, because you're thinking of like puritanical (laughs) Lisa watching these sex scenes. All of these people. Who are supposed to be like these average everyday people are having the steamiest, most athletic, most visually stunning sex I have ever seen in my entire life. Where I'm just yeah, like, I, I, you know, even when they're being awkward, I'm just like, well, it's definitely better so, than what I'm doing. My dad asked me if I was watching anything interesting. And I was like, you know what, dad? I'm watching a show that I think you would actually really, really like called Insecure oh on God. HBO. Now, oh. there's a lot of sex in it, Dad, and it is explicit. And he's like, It's I'm... mostly in a wheelbarrow fashion. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I was like, I, you know, like, so you'd have to be comfortable with that. But I think, I think Insecure, your, your dad would my dad would, would really enjoy. Did he uh, watch that's... Girls? No, he didn't watch Girls. No, my dad doesn't that's really watch funny. HBO. You know, because okay. he's a network dude. He's like, I'm going to watch Big Bang Theory for the thousandth time. Well, he is apparently the majority. Yeah, I know. I know. Not I the know. majority of people we know. Because yeah. we, we oh, only man. run with the cool kids. Yeah. That's interesting. If if your dad watches Insecure, please report back. I will. I will. I will. <laughs> that, that's hilarious. But it's just um, statuesque people just... Make, <laughs> making wheelbarrows. Looking yeah. amazing. That bank teller. Woo. I love oh, how, no, like, man. Uh, <laughs> when Issa finally has sex with Daniel, and she, and they're having sex on the couch and on the floor, and uh, like, like clearly, it's like hours and hours <laughs> of really uh, outstanding, performative sex. 
And yeah. then for her to go to Lawrence and like, it's a mistake. It just happened. Nothing I, I just happens for like four hours on the couch and on the floor and yeah. standing and sitting. Well, like she, clearly, she, that's she was sem- in the moment. I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like she was on a de- she was on a plane of existence that I have never been on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's it, it gets that way. And this this season, you're in season two. There's probably more to come. So, yeah. uh, well, Pun more intended. <laughs> we both got but, there. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I guess there's no review cast. So I guess we'll just kind of say that was the review cast. Yeah, I mean, there you go. <laughs> we we went long on that. Pun yeah. intended. Yeah, oh, Daniel man, so. style. We podcasted on the couch. We podcasted on the floor. <laughs> So yeah, I guess we'll 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 just say that's the review cast. But no worry, we'll we'll be back next week with a proper because you know we have a couple of big releases coming out um, that I'm looking forward to. So, My mind yeah. is just in the dirtiest place now. I'm like big releases <laughs> up top. <laughs> oh man! Oh, what did we start? What did we start? Uh, this is your fault, Brian. Right, you dirty <laughs> my. You sullied my mind. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, let's go ahead and get into some uh, get into some plugs before we close everything plugs. out. Plugs. Very so, sexual. Uh, oh man, uh, we can't get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, comic book couples counseling. I see that you uh, just uploaded the uh, Mark makes comics episode. Yeah. Uh, what else we got in store uh, on the CBCC? We're doubling down this week with two episodes coming no, out. No, 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 no. I don't think we're going to do that. I don't oh, never mind. I th- okay. I okay. think we're going to have the episode out this week, which is the f- second part in our Harley and Ivy conversation. That's right. Which uh, we're focusing on the uh, 2001 series solo title called Harley Quinn. Uh, it's the Welcome to Metropolis story arc. Um, Lisa and I have recorded half of that episode. And uh, pretty good so far, Lisa. What do you think? Uh, I think it's great. I'm really excited about our love guru for this particular couple. We had to swivel because okay. I made a bad choice on the first episode that and I had happens. to switch. Um, so our our love guru is Lindsay King Miller of the Sex Advice column, Ask a Queer Chick. And I, I've um, in this first in this episode coming out this week. Um, I start with her introduction of the book, and uh, I'm really excited about her message, and I'm really, uh, I feel privileged to have her sp- perspective and apply her perspective uh, on these characters. Yeah, and it's a really weird storyline, too, where Harley and uh, Ivy have ditched Gotham and fled to Metropolis, and uh, Harley takes up a life as a uh, an advice columnist at the Daily Planet, also trying to bag Jimmy Olsen uh, in secret or like he doesn't realize it's Harley. He thinks it's his advice columnist because she has like feelings of revenge for the way he treated her uh, in some other storyline. And then on top of that, Bizarro comes to town. I hate Bizarro. And Lisa loves Bizarro. Don't uh, listen is, to her. I'm not using b- Bizarro speak. I literally mean he's the worst character. I have no patience for him. <laughs> and I like Bizarro. So that's it's a fun arc to talk about. Uh, and then next week on Comic Book Couples Counseling, we're going to drop another Creator Corner episode like the Mark Makes Comics, but this time talking to the legendary comic book artist Stephen R. Bissett, who you heard last week in Dork, I mm. talked to about his new book on The Brood, and that episode dropped this week on the It Mod Chatcast channel. You can listen to that now. It's a great conversation. But then on Comic Book Couples Counseling, Lisa and I talked to him about Swamp Thing and Abigail Arcane. And that was an amazing chat. We're excited to release that out onto yeah. the world. And, and I just didn't want to like pair that with Harley and Ivy. I wanted to give both episodes uh, a full week on their own because okay. they're both so good. We're programming for one podcast on another podcast. We're yeah. really being efficient. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> We're being efficient on the couch. We're being efficient on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So definitely follow them at CBCC Podcast on Twitter and check out the podcast on in the mouth of darkness.com and also Apple Podcasts, Podbean, and everywhere podcasts can be found. And Brad, you also did mention Chatcast, and I do see that that episode is up with uh, Stephen R. Bissett of The Brood. And it's uh, doing which, quite well, which is nice. For yeah, a chat yeah. cast. 
for a chat cast but, that's doing quite well. We shouldn't qualify yeah. that. We Don't should just pretend it. that lots and lots of people are listening. You know, it's just, chat casts, the listens have been a little light lately, but that's okay. <laughs> people are coming back and discovering old episodes. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. Yeah. But the yeah. Stephen Bissett brood chat is doing really, really well. Yeah. Which is nice. That's great. That's great. Anything what's uh you get you know what's uh what's next uh, uh, on deck for chat cast? Yeah, we're gonna talk to Eliza Hitman, the director of Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, which you can now stream. That's now available through that Amazon Prime video channel. We love that movie. It was one of our faves of Sundance. It's a hard watch in some ways, but it's a really, really satisfying one. Yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, and also, Bill and Claire's Excellent Adventures. Um, it doesn't seem like they've uh, uploaded anything recently, but they do have their YouTube channel, and it seems like Billy is uploading some older episodes to their YouTube channel. So definitely check that out and subscribe to their channel over there I at Bill and Claire's Excellent Adventures. I think our dorks who have children are discovering that the self-isolation time is, uh, pretty darn hard. <laughs> I've been yeah, talking yeah. to my brother and he, like my little brother, he just has one child and but both he and his wife work and it's like it sounds like a real nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And Billy's oh, got man. three kids and you know, like, it's just you know, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot it's, to deal it, with. It's a lot. It, it's, it's a lot. But Brad you know, and I Billy's... just high five each other every day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Billy's doing what he can, and uh, you know he's, he's still being creative. And um, so we definitely look forward to the next things that uh, him and Claire do on the podcast channel and for the Itmod Network as well. Hashtag um, tag Team Claire. I'm Team Claire. <laughs> team Claire. There you go. Yeah. Hashtag Team Claire. Let's get that trending. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So, uh, Lisa, what are you looking forward to this week? I'm looking forward to binging the rest of season three of, of season two and then season three of Insecure, whether Brad comes along with me or not. I'm not going anywhere. Right. Um, actually, right. <laughs> we stopped watching uh, episode eight of Making the Cut. Uh, to record okay. this episode. So I do not know who the final three are as of yet. Um, okay. Team Xander, I love him. Though it does look like uh, poor Megan. She's screwed. She's, She's not making it She's out of this app. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like the top three are going to be... S oh, maybe that's spoilery. Uh, but I'm Team Xander. Um, so that is going to be wrapping up next week with the final three and then the final two. And I'm very excited. All right, and you can follow her at Sidewalk Siren on Twitter and Instagram, and also at Baked Dork on, uh, was it tw Twitter and Instagram for Baked Dork? Yeah, but to, to tell you the truth, I haven't <laughs> updated those in years, and I don't have the heart to tell Darren, but I do have the heart to tell you. I do not okay. update those, but okay. I don't update my, my letterbox either, and I still want people to follow it. There you go, so follow her on uh, letterbox at Sidewalk Siren. Uh, Brad Gullickson, what are you looking forward to this week? Uh, I'm looking forward to the Netflix film Extraction, starring uh, Chris yeah. Hemsworth, uh, My Man Thor. Very excited about that. I'm looking forward to reading more comic books. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading my first Astro Boy manga. I'm excited about that because I want to read that before I start the manga series Pluto. So, yeah. Okay. All right, cool, cool. And so follow that guy at Mouth Dork yes. on all social media. Everywhere. Uh, there you go, everywhere, everywhere at Mouth Dork. Uh, and I am uh, the Turtle Dork. Uh, I'm looking forward to Extraction as well. Um, so I, I think for sure that will be our review cast. Yes. Um, also, there's a movie coming out on HBO uh, that premieres Saturday Night Bad Education. I think that premiered at Sundance. Um, and I think HBO got the rights to that, and that, that, that premieres on the 25th. So Bad Education is another uh, guess a high-profile film that's going to be coming out starring Hugh Jackman. So I'm going to try to check that out and Extraction. And uh, also looking forward to, to, well, on the day that we're recording this, Sunday night, definitely looking forward to Episode 2 of Insecure for Season 4. And uh, there's a 10-part uh, documentary on the Chicago Bulls uh, on ESPN called The Last Day. And so they're showing two episodes uh, um, every Sunday, starting this Sunday. So I'm excited as a, as a sports fan and, and as a as a Chicago Bulls fan from the 90s. 
I'm so excited to check out this 10-part uh, series on ESPN. So I'll be checking that out tonight and probably report back next week with that. Hey, Brian, I'm going to watch it too. It, does ESPN stream? Oh, I may. I think so. I'm not, I can't, I'm not sure about that, but I'll I have think to look they into do. it. I think they do, but yeah, so I'm excited to check that out. Um, so yeah, you can follow me at the Turtle Dork on Instagram, at, the, uh, at on Twitter, sorry, at the Turtle Dork one on Instagram, Brian William Young on Facebook, and also make sure you follow Darren Smith at the Disco Dork on all social medias, and remember to uh, send out some good vibes, thoughts, prayers, thoughts and, and prayers. Uh, yeah, and have him be on the speedy recovery um, to getting back. And we look forward to having him back on the podcast uh, soon, very, very soon, hopefully. Uh, also follow Billy Das at WB Das on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I guess that's going to do it for us, guys. This was a long episode, and I needed it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think we all needed that. So a good one, a good one. I think we're ending this on a high note. Yeah. All right. So uh, and with that, until next time. Boop.